Hey, this is Dominic, and this is your home for the cutting edge conversations on optimizing your personal performance, lighting up your sex life, and living a purpose driven life of your own design. These are the topics that Dominic and I have both struggled with in our own lives and still don't always get right. This is Brian. Welcome to the Great Man Podcast. You know, I'm really proud of the feedback that we've gotten on the 13-week Building Your Best Self series that we did to close out the final quarter of 2021. Many of you have emailed me, DM'd me, but also written about it in the Facebook group publicly about how that series has caused you to take tangible action in areas of your life where you've been stalling or you've been drifting. And that's been really, really encouraging to hear. However, there's one really important episode that we left out a conversation on the necessary endings that you need to make en route to your next level. You have a next level in life that's calling you. That next role at work, that next level of physical well-being, that next level of finding your purpose, whatever that next level is for you, you know where you currently are and that next level is calling you and there's something standing in the way of you getting from where you are to where you want to go. Now to move on from that current level There are things that need to end, relationships, habits, fears, behaviors, limiting self-concepts are all the common things that we talk about, but where we spend most of our time in our conversation today is about ending the good things in your life that will make way for the great to be possible. And it's oftentimes the good things that are the hardest things to identify, the hardest things to want to bring an ending to because they're still paying dividends, but not the kind of dividends that are necessary in order to get to that next level. So in this episode, we're going to talk about how to know. When I say no, I mean knowing from a deep place of being when it's time to bring a necessary ending to a particular part of your life. We'll talk about the three types of areas of your life that are ripe to prune, right? Pruning means bringing an ending, trimming it away. I'm going to be sharing some really personal stories about the ending of three really good long-term relationships that I'm making right now, real time, to make space for the next level. One of them I've talked about a lot on the podcast, and I'll reveal that shortly. How and why you need to end things with integrity, because how you end things says a lot about you. And then finally, why you should end things. Create necessary endings, even if you don't know what replaces it next. Let's get going on today's conversation of the necessary endings that you need to make en route to your next level. Wow, man. This has been a big week for me this past week of making some really significant changes in my life around some commitments, some relationships I've had for three, four, five years that are coming to completion now. None bigger than the men's group that you and I have been a part of for the last four years together that I've referenced ad nauseum on this podcast as being a life-changing experience and a brotherhood of men. And this past Monday night, I said goodbye. I'm just curious, man, from you know where you sat and what I shared, and I'll get into you know my reasons for it, but how did that impact you? Well, I think you saw my tears on Monday. Yeah. Those were very real. Yeah, man, there was a lot of sadness there and also a ton of understanding. It was clear to me, I believe it was clear to the group too, that this was coming from a place of graduation, of ready for the next thing and that it had done its job. So yeah, man, it was mixed emotions. It'll be sad to see you, not see you every week in that kind of format. You know, in the work that we do here on the podcast, where we do in the mastermind, you are in a leadership capacity, right? With the men's group, you're one of the group. And so I got to see the kind of the behind the scenes, if you will, like the real time, like a lot of the stuff that we go through on this podcast, we're doing the mastermind, we've worked through it. It's refined, right? We talk about this podcast before recording it. But the whole point, right, in men's group was to really tap into what was currently there, no matter what it was. Yep. And so, yeah, man, it was, it's, it's sad and completely understand. Yeah. The group was in, incredible. You were incredible in understanding my, where, where I was coming from. And every Monday night for two hours since March of 2018, 
we got together in person or, you know, since the pandemic virtually to work on this practice of emotional fluency, right? Like the ability to feel a feeling, to name that feeling, to be with that feeling non-reactively and to express that feeling. I had been on the inner work journey for about eight years. You know, I'd done a lot of inner work around therapy, coaching, sex addicts, anonymous. I'd gone to all the workshops around the world, studied NLP, hypnosis. Like I'd done a lot. Read a few books. Read quite a few books, wrote a book at that point in time. Like, <laughs> but the one thing I didn't have access to before I showed up to that men's group was my heart. It was like that final frontier of being able to unlock something that I'd locked away many decades ago, as a lot of as a lot of young men and boys do, when feeling feelings is not really an option for you because you know, boys don't cry, it's weak to feel things, wounds are weak. And the one thing that was able to let that iron come off to unlock that prison cell of my heart was this men's group. It revolutionized my life. My relationships have gotten deeper. Intimacy has come more easily. Uh, the depth of that intimacy with women, with relationships, with the clients that I take on, right? Like all of that, I directly tie back to the work that I did in this men's group. And what's been really interesting is over the last, I would say, six to nine months or so, ever since I did that Artist's Way program, you know, the book by Julia Cameron, it's a 12-week program where every single morning you do this practice called morning pages. You get right out of bed, you open up a book, you just scribble whatever's in your mind, stream of consciousness, no judgment. You get the gunk out of your head and you write until three pages are complete. That's it. And the thinking behind that is there's so much repetitive crap in your head that until it gets out, nothing new can come up. You know, she calls it a dust buster for the brain. And so many of the world's most creative people, like Martin Scorsese, like Elizabeth Gilbert, attribute a big part of like their creative genius and success to going through the morning pages process. Ever since I did that process and finished the 12 weeks, there has been a profound shift inside of me around not only my ability to create, my creativity is flowing in a different way, but it actually started to bring into focus a lot of the, the relationships, longstanding ones that I'd had in my life and started to ask me to question them and had those things plateaued and were ready for the next trajectory shift or had they simply come to completion? I think that's a big question that most people need to ask about a lot of things in their lives like, Am I just at a temporary plateau? You know, in relationships, uh, romantic ones, plateaus happen and then boom, you, it makes way to something bigger. Or is this complete? And it's hard to ever truly know the answer to that question. You have to like, that's where the inner compass and your trust of that inner compass really has to take hold. I started asking that question of a number of things in my life with this men's group, with my coach, who David Waldis, who's been on this podcast, who's incredible. He's gifted. I've spoken with him every week for three and a half years. That is now coming to completion in the next month. My fitness trainer, who's been incredible for the last year, that's coming to the completion in the next month. I've had you know monthly calls with someone who I've loved for the past five years. That's coming to completion. And all of those are in service of, I'm making space because I know that whatever next level is calling me, that next level requires space for new things to come in, new relationships to come in, new opportunities to come in. And until I clear some of that space, that next level is just going to be waiting for me. So it's, it's clear there's a theme, something's going on in your life that's asking you to create space. And you mentioned three or four of those things that have, you've been, that have been happening in your life on a regular frequency for a long time. Let's use the men's group as an example. And the, the overarching question here is like, how did you know? How did you know that was one of them? And what I'm most curious about is what was the first inclination? Like what was the first feeling or thought that popped up that made you start to question, is this something that has plateaued or has come to a conclusion for me? This is such a big question that you ask around how do you know? I first have to start by setting some context and then I'll, I'll answer that. When we did the Building Your Best Self series at the end of 2021, that 13 episode series, we talked about how every man knows the next level that he wants to get to in a specific area of his life. Whether it's like, you know, financially speaking, relationship speaking, physical well being, these kinds of things. And he also knows the current level that he's at. 
right? And that there's something preventing him from like getting from where he is to that next level. There's like something in the way, drift, lone wolfing. There's some ceiling that's in place. So when I was going through the Artist Way program, the thing that came up for me was this burning desire to have more space in my life, to create, to wander, to feel lightness and levity. Like I miss playing sports. I miss competing. I miss having weeknights available to me. Like if you look at my schedule, Monday nights, two hours of men's group. Wednesday nights, I'm running the digital mastermind. Thursday nights, I'm running mastermind 1.0 and 2.0. And then Tuesday night, which is the only open night of the week, I'm usually having a coaching call with my coach, David. So it's like, I don't have weeknights at all. When the weekends come around, I'm usually so tired from all the stuff that I'm doing that I don't even like really have like the energy to join a team or to go out dating. And, you know, I I say to myself, I want to find my queen. I want to feel lightness. I want to feel space to create. And there's no space for this. And with the men's group in particular, like, you know, you heard me go on my rant. This past week was my goodbye week. But the week before that, or two weeks before that was the, the announcement. And I shared with the group, it, it was almost like this, this, it was like an anger, a frustration of, I just want to get out. I'm tired of this shit. I don't want to be in another heavy space where we're doing heavy emotional work on a Monday night. I'm in men's work all the time, holding space in space where we're dealing with emotions on Monday nights. I want to play. I want to go out on dates. I want to be on a softball team. I want to be in volleyball. I want to play disc golf. Like, or I just want to sit on my fucking couch and watch a TV show and eat food and not think about anything emotional. And, and I just want to fuck off. Like, and really quick, Dom, as soon as soon and as soon as you said that, it was a slow clap. Yeah, around around the digital circle it was like, you're ready. This is this is good because Dominic wouldn't have said those things. You may not have even felt those things, and if you did feel them, you may not have even been aware of it prior to being through the group. So, it, like when you did that, it didn't feel like an affront. Like this isn't a valuable group. Like we know what the group is, and it felt like cool, man. Like that's amazing. Well, that's what was so beautiful about you guys, which like this changed some of the karma of my life. This is a next level area that I'm working on that I think a lot of our listeners can relate to is I have been afraid at many times in my life to do what's in best alignment with my heart because I feel it's going to upset someone else. They're either going to be angry at me, they're going to withdraw their love from me, or they're not going to think I'm as special as they once did. And I've been afraid of all of that. And so I stay complacent or I stay stuck in places, in relationships, enduring things that just don't feel in alignment for me. I knew with you guys that you'd be sad to see me go. I also knew unequivocally that you would all celebrate. You know, like you said, you called it a graduation. I had no idea to the extent with which you guys would do it. And and this last Monday night, you guys did an incredible celebration of me where each of you went around and just put me in a king's chair and spoke to my king for, you know. 10 minutes a piece, which was overwhelming and beautiful. But I think what you're pointing out here is so important was when I was just fucking real and let the emotions rip and let you guys see what was going on inside of me, which is this burning desire to have more freedom, to have more levity, to have more space and more play. And this group did exactly what I needed it to do, which was to tap me back into my heart, to feel my feelings to allow me to even actually make this move with conviction. You mentioned how and why you used to stay in relationships, in situations longer than before, and it can be summarized by fear, right? There's a fear that something is going to be going away. And this is a case in that I've never seen someone that felt fully aligned in the decision to end something, not benefit all parties. That may feel like a really strong statement. And if you think about in your past relationships, I have ended some relationships in a really aligned way. I've ended other relationships in an awful way. (laughs) (laughs) And it's not to say either of them don't hurt people, right? There are feelings in the moment. I was sad, right? When you left men's group, I was sad. That hurt. Also understood it. But I've been able to see in my life when I end things in full alignment, that opens up space for the other group, for the other person, whatever else is ending and call it. I don't know what it is. Call it an act of God. Call it coincidence. I don't know what it is, but I tend to see when people act in alignment with what their actual true belief is, not from a place of woundedness or a place of fear, that it opens up a space for the other party too. So what Dominic doesn't know is that 
men's group now without Dominic is asking bigger questions of itself. Like, what do we want to be? Are we going to bring in new people? Are we going to evolve again? Like, what does this look like? Right. So there's a there's a, a downstream effect to make these decisions in an aligned way that are bigger than just us. Totally. And I love that. And with my coach, David, who I've worked with for three and a half years, who's l- like changed my life in so many ways and has been there for me in my darkest of times, who's given me guidance when I didn't know where to go and has tapped me open to a deeper sense of intuition in my own inner compass. Now that I'm his longest tenured client, like it's to work with an individual coach for three and a half years, week by week, every single week, like that's that's very rare. Now he's starting to ask himself, you know, questions around, okay, like who are the clients I want to call in at this point? It represents a major transition for both of us. And like you were saying, when it comes from an aligned place, everyone has the opportunity. Everyone has the opportunity, not saying everyone will take that opportunity. Everyone has the opportunity to level up. I think about, you You asked me this question before we started recording, like, how do you know when it's time? We always talk about how, you know, oftentimes we get wake up calls from drift in one of three ways. It's either like the feather tickling the back of your neck, kind of like, you know, tapping you on the shoulder, like, hey, I'm over here. You get the two by four across the head when you don't pay attention to that. And then you get the Mack truck that runs you over when you don't pay attention to the two by four. As I started listening to my inner compass, more over time, I respond much more to the feather tickle than I do the back truck or the two by four. But let me give you a two by four example. Back in 2016, when I had just left corporate and I was starting my coaching business, at that time, I had no clients, I had no income. So I started taking on clients that could pay me, not necessarily clients that aligned with my values or belief systems. And I ended up with two clients who were big money makers financial advisors and, and, a, and a guy in another profession that also made you know probably about seven figures a year. And these guys, I don't know if we were so misaligned on many of our core values. And, and one of them would be both of these men were cheating on their wives, unapologetically, were flaunting it, had no remorse whatsoever, didn't want to even look at it or reflect on it, take responsibility for like, you know, the behaviors that got them there. But I stayed in it because these guys were paying me. I stayed in it and I, man, I rationalized everything. And the wake up call I got was, you know, one of these guys, he wasn't actually even paying me. He got sponsored by one of his like, you know, top partnerships in business to pay the $5,000 fee. So he never paid a penny out of his pocket. After those, you know, 90 days and those $5,000 were up, he said he wanted to continue working with me. It was going to have to come out of his pocket. He didn't pay any of the invoices for month one, for month two, for month three. And then when I finally called him on, I'm like, dude, the hell's going on? I'm like, you owe me 5,000 bucks. He's like, 5,000? I can't afford that. I thought that you were you know, only $500 a month. Two big things here. I've seen him spend $5,000 on his Gumar. <laughs> you know, like- what, what's, it? what's a Gumar? If you haven't watched The Sopranos, that's your side piece. It's not your wife. It's, you, you can't reference things from 20 years ago, man. Come on. Sopranos is a as Gumar. current as it- <laughs> like, that, 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 like it's timeless. Everyone knows what- the, if you haven't seen Sopranos, then that is your fault. That is your responsibility to catch up. And so I knew he was lying about that. And the fact that like 500 bucks a month for the work that we were doing, it was like, it was a slap. And I, and I just said, dude, we're done. And I looked at myself and I said, I put myself in this position that I'm working with someone that like, he doesn't value me, wasn't willing to pay out of his own pocket. But I, I put myself in this position because there was a part of me that, was afraid to not have clients and therefore I was taking the money, taking the easy way. And that relationship needed to end. I went to the other client who was also cheating on his wife and I said, it's over. And I made a decision at that point in time that I would never take money from people whose values aren't aligned with mine. Sometimes that's been a harder road in the short term, you know, like there's paychecks I've not taken as a result of that. But now five years later, I'm surrounded with people whose hearts are aligned with mine, whose money's aligned with mine. And when, when I read the book, The Soul of Money by Lynn Twist, like where money is a manifestation of your highest values in life, I'm in complete alignment with that. And that feels really good. When I look at some of these, these endings of situations, it reminds me, we, we really enjoy referencing, and I love this, being from Chicago, the Chicago Bulls dynasty of the 90s. And if you don't know, I think I, I want to. What, what do you remember the last year the Bulls won? It might have been ninety six, ninety seven season, maybe. Let's pretend it was right late late nineties, whenever it was. 
a long time ago. The Bulls haven't been good since, right? They really haven't. And there's a reason for that. And the, the I think the lesson here is how we end things matters. So knowing knowing that it's a thing, right? Knowing that being able to feel like this is time to move on from something in my life is one thing. But how we end it matters. And how we ended with you, with men's group, right? You had the announcement and the outburst and the here's what I want. And we high-fived you and said congratulations. But then we had a ceremony around it, right? The next week after that, we came back together. We did. We ended it right. And the reason that's important is it sets a precedent. At the end of the Bulls dynasty, the management, Ugh. the ownership decided to blow up the team that still had a lot of juice in it. This is a team that won two consecutive three-peats. Yeah. Right when they got rid of Michael Jordan and and I think they they dismantled the entire Phil team. Jackson. Everybody else in the NBA, the coach, right, looked at them and said, "That's not a group I want to work with," because of how things ended. And so, how we end things matters so much. I've had romantic relationships before where I waited until I was triggered, until like I went from feather to two by four to Mack truck until I cheated, until something else awful happened, until I could get angry, until I had enough proof that this was something that I had to get out of. And I started in my in my early dating history, I started to realize like, oh, I'm a person that ends things this way. I wait until we have to get out. And that didn't serve me for over a decade. Yeah. So I, as we as we talk about these things, like the the belief that's coming up for me is like how we end things like really, really matters for what's next. How we end things. John Wineland is the one who said this that I, always stuck with me. How you end things says a lot about you. A lot. You know, when you're talking about some of those endings that you had in the past where you wait for the, the two by four, you wait for the Mack truck, usually you're in such a state of like you're hemorrhaging, <laughs> like you're bleeding out. It's really hard to end things from a resourceful place to do it with integrity when you're bleeding out, you know, and your guts are dragging out around on the floor. When I started to live much more intentionally in life, purpose driven, when, when I'm leaving men's group, it's not because I'm kicking and screaming. It's not because it's broken. When I left my corporate job after 15 years, the biggest mistakes people had or misperceptions people had is like, oh, you just, you got tired of the rat race, right? Like you just fucking hated it. You couldn't take it anymore, right? I'm like, no. It had served its purpose. It had come to its completion that that book had been written. When I decided to leave, like I gave my my boss's boss like an eight month heads up and like a grace period so they can plan around it. There was trust that was built. By the way, like my boss's boss at the time is now one of my largest clients. Do you know what I'm saying? And like has hired. So how you uh, you end things says a lot about you. And when we live much more intentionally then we can start to make those transitions like I'm doing with David, my coach, like I'm doing with my trainer who's done an incredible fitness trainer over the past year. I'm doing it from a place of integrity, honoring them, thanking them for everything they've brought into my life. And then we can wrap it up with love so that I carry that into this new space of, okay, I don't know what's coming next exactly, but I feel really good about how I'm setting myself up for it. In pop culture, we see this all the time with the the excuses of why people break up. It's not you, it's me. <laughs> right. Bullshit. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, like these, these sort of things that that we, we love to like make the excuses around and not actually address what the issue is. I see this all the time in the HR work that I do uh, when people leave. So the best leave story I've ever heard is this person came to their supervisor and they said – very similar to what you did with men's group. They said, this job has been amazing. This is what I've learned. These are the contributions I've made. And this is how I've grown from it. It's time for me to move on, which was devastating for the employer because this person was uh, like an A, A star player. And he said, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to give you two weeks. I'm going to give you time to find and I will actively search with you for my replacement and I will train them up to a point where I feel like they're competent and they can they can move forward, not so much as they're repeating exactly what I did, but they know the nuts and bolts so they can do it on their own. That's beautiful. That took four weeks <laughs> right, to find someone, to train them up. So it took an extra two weeks. But how they left, the stories that that employer still tells about that employee, like pays dividends like over and over and over and over again. Yeah. So like how we end things says a lot about us. It matters. 
And there is a right way to do it. I want to share one more story that you just triggered, and then we'll introduce another concept here that I think will be really important. When I decided to leave the 15 years of work at Prudential, I reflected upon over that 15-year period of time, how many people who I saw that I'd worked with for over a decade who had been with the business sometimes like 10, 20, even 30 years just disappear one day. You know, like they would just disappear. They would go to a Oof. like another competitor. They'd take another job somewhere else and they were gone. People that you'd speak to like, you know, every day or every other day or people that you'd done like you'd been in the trenches with and no explanation, just I'm out. And then you'd see their, their job uh, on LinkedIn change and you're just like, wow, that's it. And I remember thinking that was like, a, I, I didn't want to go out that way. You know, these are people that I, on some level, you know, like thought of as my work family. And so when it was time for me to leave, I wanted to control that narrative. So I filmed just a very short three minute video. I still have these videos on YouTube. They're in private mode, but I filmed a three minute video for all my Prudential and colleagues. And I just said to my Prudential family, I just made the announcement that I'm going to be leaving in a couple of weeks. And I wanted you to hear directly from me why I'm making this choice. I've loved this business. It's given me everything I've ever wanted. I knew I would never leave this company unless it was going to be to pursue my passion, which is exactly what I'm doing. And here's what that looks like. I hope we can stay in touch. And I ended up getting the most incredible, compassionate, loving, supportive messages in return. And on my last day, I ended up staying in the office on that Friday afternoon into the evening, sitting in my room, my office that overlooked where the ball drops in Times Square on New Year's. I had a glass of bourbon and I just responded to every single email. And I didn't leave until every single one of those emails were responded. It was like a couple hundred. And then I closed out the light grabbed a cardboard box, jumped on the subway, went home. And that chapter was done. And people still talk about that. And I still feel a sense of, you know, of love and pride from that moment. A benefit that comes from doing this in, in this manner, and you just said it, is the word done. There is a finality, there is a conclusion, and that space can open up immediately. Or on the other hand, often it gets dragged out or like, maybe this is working, maybe it's not working. Let's try something. Let's see other people or like whatever the, the in-between is. Yeah. There's not a clarity of like, this is now done. And you sitting there late at night on a Friday, responding back to everybody, you could then say, and it is done and I can move forward, right? So like, like how many open loops do we have in our life? Because it's kind of in the gray zone. It's, it's like not done, but it's not really going. And even for men's group, Dom, like you said that you felt that for a couple months, you were just you recognize retrospectively that you were going through the motions, and that's fine. But then when the recognition happened, so now we're going to end. That's right. And and sometimes time needs to pass. Right. And time needs to process to be like, okay, is this just a plateau? Am I going through something, or is there something deeper calling to say, okay, this is this is coming to its completion? And going back to your original question, which is the one I think needs to be asked over and over and over again: How do you know? How do you know? That answer becomes much clearer as we become much clearer on who is our great man. <laughs> your great man is the man who you are at your fullest potential. He's who you are when you find out your purpose and live in alignment with that purpose every day of your being. And when I'm clear on who my great man is, and I'm clear on what that next level is I'm pursuing in my life, when I'm clear on what gives me my greatest energy... Then when I find myself in these plateaus, when I find myself not feeling as lit up or as passionate, then it gives me a real deep sense of like, oh, okay. It's because this thing has brought itself to completion. It's you know the layer that onion needs to now peel back and I'm, I'm getting one layer deeper. I think this would be a good place to, you know, to reintroduce a concept that we've talked about on the podcast before, but right now it's as important as ever. And it's this concept that comes from the book, Necessary Endings by Dr. Henry Cloud, the rose bush and pruning. So pruning is, is really the key concept. And the analogy is a rose bush by its very nature breeds more life than it physically can sustain, which means it will produce more rosebuds than it can physically sustain. And if it doesn't have the care of an expert pruner to snip away these rosebuds, it will collapse under the weight of its own life and die. If you think about that metaphorically for your own life, like our lives are rich, abundant. We have more options than any time in humanity for where to invest your time. You have more food options than ever before. 
we are literally like caving in under the weight of all of our options and all of our obligations. And so if we're not expertly pruning over the course of time, that sprawl, that expanse of our lives, like it can become overwhelming. So no matter how good you are at Marie kondo your life, you know, like you kind of have to keep a, a meticulous focus over the course of time to just being like, what no longer serves me? And the three rosebuds that you have to look at pruning, this is to complete the analogy are the dead rosebuds, the atrophied rosebuds, and the good rosebuds. The dead rosebuds are the ones that are clearly dead that need to be snipped in order for like new life to come in and make way. Those dead rosebuds in like human terms could be those toxic relationships. <laughs> these are obvious, right? These are these are I'm still doing it, but it's got to go. Right, it's it's like it's it's the obvious this is a net negative in my life. <laughs> Whether it's relationships or net negative behaviors, smoking, drinking, um medicating, like they're obvious but they're hanging around because it's painful to cut them off in some way. But like that's the low-hanging fruit. Those things need to be snipped. They're usually pretty obvious. The atrophied rosebuds, these are a little bit more difficult to identify. These are the ones that like, if you invest some time and energy and nurturing and care, like maybe, maybe you can resuscitate that relationship or you can resuscitate that business or resuscitate whatever it is, right? That rehab, that car, rehab, that part of the house, whatever it is. But maybe you're just pouring money, time, energy into a bottomless pit and those may need to be, you know, pruned over the course, like the, the ability to identify, yeah, that I could rehab it, but for every 100% of effort that I rehab, I only get a 5% return. No bueno. Those need to be snipped. And then the last one, and this is the one that like I've been talking about, I've been dealing with is the good rosebuds. We all know that the enemy of great is not bad. It's good. <laughs> good is the thing that stands in the way of greatness. Good can become very comfortable. Our men's group, for me, when I first started it, it was exceptional, revolutionized my life. Same thing with Sex Addicts Anonymous. My first two years in Sex Addicts Anonymous were the most transcendent, eye-opening, healing experiences in my life. And then I hit a plateau where the gains, where the, like, the knowledge, the growth and development just didn't have the same trajectory anymore. There was always a good reason to stay, always. And I can give a litany of them, especially for our men's group. But if I'm truly making space for greatness, that next level, I have to learn when good is standing in the way of what greatness wants to move in. And so in my life, in my case right now, my coaching with David, the men's group, my relationship with my fitness trainer, these are things that are now opening up new space for that next level of growth. And that's the rosebud that need to be trimmed. Don, when you trim those good rosebuds, are there any fears that come up around, I'm going to miss the value that was there before, or I'm not sure exactly what is next? Talk to us about that a little bit. Yes, to both. For example, with men's group, this next iteration, as you were just talking about, now you're asking bigger questions about who do we bring in the group and what if men's group goes through like a revolution and creates something that's like, oh my God, I would have wanted that. I wanted to be a part of that. And now you're off guys doing the thing that I would have wanted to be a part of. Like there is that fear, there is that risk of, did I miss? But on a deeper level, there's this sense of like knowing because my inner compass, I've learned to trust it over the course of time by following, you know, the feather and, and seeing how it's turned out. Like you said, when, when a person follows their, their aligned state of being, you've never seen it not work out in the long run. For me, I've never not had it work out for me when I followed the truth in my heart. And so, yes, there's fear. I have no idea. I honestly have no idea what's going to take the place of these things. I know though that like I'm starting to entertain what's lighting me up inside. Like, well, I do want to find my queen. Maybe it's time to like find a relationship coach. Maybe it's time to like go out and, you know, date a little bit more. I haven't been on any dates in like months. Maybe it's time to hire a business coach to help, you know, scale some of this work and scale some of the business. So I don't know what's going to take place or take its space. But I'm actually kind of excited about leaving that space open for something really badass to to come in and be like, dude, this is even better than you could have imagined. I can't wait to do the podcast where you come in and you're like, so it happened. Mm -hmm. Right. This space is now filled. Because <laughs> I know you talk about being on the couch and eating some food, watching a TV show, and that that is useful. 
in some parts. Yeah. But I know you won't be doing not that long. long. No, not long. But man, I mean, like to put a, a cap on the question, back in 2017, 2018, that was when I went through like a similar big up level like I'm talking about now. I left Sex Addicts Anonymous. That was a big move. I stopped paying for coaching. Up to that time, like like for seven or eight years, I'd done nonstop intensive coaching with other people, other modalities, other workshops, therapy. And I got so muddled in my brain with everyone else's voices that I couldn't hear my own. I didn't have my own inner compass. I was deferring it, relinquishing my own authority and agency to other people's expertise. And I remember I was just like, I have to stop. And I, I went cold turkey. I had no more things that I was paying for, no more personal development. I didn't even read any books for like nine months. I just wanted to find my voice. What ended up happening in that space, men's group emerged. Men's group came to me and I was able to join the men's group, which did exactly what I was looking for. Found my inner compass, opened my heart, was able to like feel again. Six months after that, I ended up meeting David, my coach, who is not a coach who tells me what to do, but helps me to get to my own inner state of alignment to find my own inner compass. And so all of a sudden, like when I gave space then those things showed up and now I'm at this next level where it's like, okay, I'm tired of working my ass off. I'm tired of like full schedules and grinding. I want alignment. I want play. I want fun. I want adventure. I want my queen. And that's where, how do I know? Like those are the things that let me know. There's a lot of clarity there. I, I heard it during men's group. I hear it on this podcast. There's a lot of clarity on the desire which I know we talked a lot about during that year-end series of building your best self. So like, if you're going to start somewhere, start there. What do I want? What do I desire? Right? And that is going to make this conversation about ending things so much more clear. So much more clear. This episode probably should have been in the building your best self series, which by the way, if like, if you haven't listened to it, it's, it's, it's very popular. I, I see the, the, the downloads and the stats, like people are really going through that and like actually sticking with it and listening to all 13 episodes because they build on each other. But this necessary endings conversation is a really big one. And the necessary endings can come in many different forms, endings of relationships, endings of limiting beliefs, endings of behaviors. And I'm curious for you, man, because for me, one of the endings that needs to happen that is happening is the not speaking up. You know, when I feel that that truth of my heart to call someone out, like on bad behavior because I didn't want to deal with their negative reactions or their blowback or them thinking that I'm no longer like the compassionate guy or not liking me. Like instead of that, I'm now putting the line in the sand. And then there are the people who respond to that and they're like, got it. I know where you stand now. Let's fix that and let's move on. Those are my people. The people who don't want to look at that, who don't want to like have a, a productive conversation, they're moving on. And that's creating levity. That's creating space. That's creating more wind at my sails. I'm curious, is there like, is there something like that that's going on in your inner world right now that, that I could see a smile coming across your face? So I guess that answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, there, there is. And, and for me specifically, it's, it's in the business world. I started my current company with the desire. You mentioned desire, Dominic, three, four years ago when you wanted to, to find your own voice, right? And you found a men's group and you found a coach that helped you, helped you find that. And, and here you are today, right? Multiple books, running masterminds, and life looks very, very different. For me, a little over two years ago, I wanted to start a company with the sole purpose of proving that I could build something of value, doing it with people that I enjoyed working with, and make money while, while doing it and become stable, if you will. Those three goals are done. So now I'm like, well, what do I, gosh, what do I really want? Like, what do I really want to build? And so there's not been a conversation to have with someone about I'm leaving. The conversation that I've been having with myself is like, how do I build these structures so that I can leave, so that I can create these spaces? And so I'm very much in process of, of that right now because what I desire is building something long-term that has a huge impact on the people that we work with. It's having that space to build physical products, physical space, and to learn. So like those are like my big three things that I'm really, really desiring. And to come back to you on the men's group thing, we're all taking a look at is what men's group has traditionally been, is it, is it working for us? And my answer to that has been really clear, yes. 
I, I still have work to do in that space. And to like, I need that practice, that dojo to come in and be a witness and have me witness in tapping into my feelings. And so that doesn't feel done yet. It feels like it's something that's still very much in progress. And I'm totally fine with that. So yeah, man, that's a few things that are coming to conclusion and some things that are continuing. And that feels really good too. How did you have the awareness that those three objectives that you had when you first started your business, that you wanted to prove you could build something of value? that you wanted to work with people you liked and that you wanted to prove you could make money doing it, like have some stability. How did you have the awareness that those were complete? The reason why I'm asking that is so many people set out for goals, objectives, meet them, but never bring awareness to them. Like to the fact that, oh, the the original reasons why I got in have been met. It served its purpose. And now I don't realize why I'm unhappy or unfulfilled. I just keep on doing the thing. How did you have that awareness? Yeah, it's a, it's a really similar answer to what you had about men's group where I didn't recognize it right away, but I found myself sitting in the corner of my kitchen here at my makeshift desk for 12 to 14 hours a day and realizing that I don't actually enjoy that. When I look back at like, what did I say in the very beginning of this? Like, have I accomplished these things? I'm like, wow, like I actually have. <laughs> like, like this is sure. Could this be bigger? Absolutely. But is that where I want to be spending my energy given these other desires that I have? Like, no. I think it was a combination of two things, though. It was that, recognizing like what I don't like that I'm doing, but it was really like the gas on the fire was really having some clarity around what I do want. I want to spend more time down in my garage. I want to have freedom and flexibility to like go see my parents and not have to worry about like sitting in a chair and something getting missed. The combination of like, this isn't working for me and this is what I want in the middle was, here's a decision I have to make. That's beautiful. And it just hammers home the point that when you're lone wolfing this stuff, like you can miss it. You know, you said it was like the practice in the men's group with other guys, like bringing it to you, asking the questions that where that awareness came down and having, it's having a community. It's also having a practice. Right? These are two separate and distinct and overlapping things, but the weekly practice, every time checking in on your life so that like you, you didn't even recognize it right away, but with the practice and with the community support, you eventually got there. Yeah. And to be clear, Dominic, you're right. I didn't do that on my own. It was through the mastermind questions of what's your one bold move, right? right? It was through our men's group of like, how are you feeling right now? I'm like, actually, I feel lethargic. Right. Like why? Like business is going fine, but like, why do I feel lethargic? Right. Right. So you're right. It wasn't me just contemplating in a corner or reading a book or listening to a podcast. It was me in community that these awarenesses came more boldly and more quickly. And that's why we always talk about personal development on your own is slow. It's shallow. It's incomplete. You try to do that on your own weeks, months, years, decades, lifetimes. Like we've seen it. We've seen all versions of that with people where nothing changes. And we have a man in our our digital mastermind who we're celebrating recently because, and we're recording this on the 14th of January. His name is John Olson. What's up, John? He'd been wanting to leave the jobs that he was in to pursue his own passion and purpose. He'd been wanting to do that for five years been talking about doing it for five years. When we, when we finally started to go into that bold move exercise, he was just like, hey guys, I think it's time. Like I'm going to pull the trigger. And then he went into our digital mastermind, declared it one night. And then a week later, he followed up in the accountability group and said, I did it. And we all were able to celebrate him. And the thing that was the difference maker was over the course of time being in the group, he was able to work on that courage of like, I can do this. And to work through the what ifs and the uncertainties and have other guys support him and then to be seen and then celebrated and to be held accountable, right? When you make a move that big, there's all of that. And then all of a sudden, he's now free. He's now living in alignment. That's scary shit. You know, those those moves are scary. And we know so many guys who want so much for their lives, who want to make, who need to make those necessary endings to get to the next level, who think about it, who think about it forever. And then when you come into community, then that thing you've been thinking about actually happens. And there's a lot of proof in all the masterminds of that happening. Yeah. You and I are testimonials because like our lives are the reason why we've gotten to where we 
want to be and are continuing to chart that course is because we're eating our, you know, we're eating this cooking. Tastes pretty good. Call to action time. At the end of the episode, you heard Brian and I talk about the only way that we've been able to get to that next level in our lives reliably in an accelerated fashion is to not lone wolf it. We've done it in community with other men with having a regular weekly practice to stay unstuck, to stay out of drift and to get to those next level areas of our lives that matter. So if you've ever been curious about the digital mastermind and have wanted to know more, I finally have created a seven minute intro video that has everything you need to know about the digital mastermind, the structure, what we work on, the skills we're developing, the investments. And I've created a link at the top of the show notes here where you can go to the website with all the detail and the seven minute video. And if that lights you up, there's an opportunity to schedule a discovery call where you can learn about getting into and joining this growing community of men who are doing deep inner work going to that next level area of their lives. Link at the top of the show notes.